to our very first Ask. Oh, it just went live now. I think. Sorry if I'm. Hi everyone, and welcome to our very first Ask an Expert Google Plus Hangout. This is a new opportunity we're able to offer this year as a result of our uh, end of year fundraising campaign. So a big thank you to any of you online who contributed. Um, the idea is to give our NOSB students and educators an opportunity to ask your questions of experts on topics related to our 2015 theme, which you all know is the science of oil in the ocean. Um, we're pleased to partner with NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration on this opportunity. NOAA is a key sponsor of the NOSB, and the Office of Response and Restoration is NOAA's center of expertise in preparing for, evaluating, and responding to threats um, to our coastal environments, including oil spills and other um, harmful spills and releases and marine debris. Um, the Office uh, of Response and Restoration expertise spans oceanography, biology, chemistry, geology, and policy. And we have three experts um, online tonight, Ken Finkelstein, um, Amy McFadden, and Men Meg Imholt, to answer your questions, um, such as clarifying things you've read that you didn't quite understand or felt might be in conflict to other things you've read. Um, and maybe just to help you fill some of the gaps in your learning. Um, so I'm going to let the experts introduce themselves, but first just a few logistical points on how to get your questions to us. The easiest way is through your Gmail account. Um, make sure you're logged into Google+, and you'll see the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen that you'll use to, answer your, to ask your questions. If you are watching from a mobile device, unfortunately, even if you are logged into Google, you will not see that Q&A box. You will not be able to submit a question. Um, if you um, do not have Gmail or Google account, then we recommend you do the Hangout through the YouTube link that we've provided um, on the front page at nosb.org. There you can ask your questions as YouTube comments, and we'll be monitoring that site, and we'll copy those questions into the Hangout to make sure that they get addressed. Um, as I said, this is our first Ask an Expert Hangout and we're very interested in getting your feedback on whether you found it useful as well as other um, ideas of opportunities you'd like to see in the future that would help you better prepare for the competition and for our future annual theme. So please send us feedback to nosb at oceanleadership.org. Um, so thanks again, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Meg Imholt. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Meg Imholt. I'm the policy analyst in NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration. Um, our office, um, actually, one of the, my favorite things about our office is that we really tackle oil spills full circle. Um, it's our job to bundle all the science in case of an oil spill and really throw it all at the problem. Um, we go at, start from the beginning when we talk about preparedness We make sure that we have systems like um, programs that can do trajectory modeling that can calculate weathering for um, oil on water, um, and lots of other systems like our environmental sensitivity index or our, our environmental response management application, which all help responders really be better prepared so that when a disaster does happen, they can have all the tools that they need to respond. Um, when the oil spill does happen, Coast Guard and EPA are really taking the lead in terms of responding, but it's our job to make sure that we have all those science tools there. Um, we have people staffed or stationed around the country called scientific support coordinators, um, and their job is to really be there when an oil spill happens, to be on call for EPA and Coast Guard, um, and they are the ones that they call on to really provide the science for these emergencies. Um, once an oil spill happens, we're on call 24 7, 365 to be there and provide that science. Um, they do have a strong science background in case you guys ever want to be one when um, you finish other school. Um, but they, they are also there in the field to help choose response options, to figure out where oil is going, to figure out how it's going to hurt, um, and to answer other important response questions like. Where do we put boom, or where do we need to make sure we have people on the shoreline to protect them? Um, after an oil spill, of course, um, there are still very often damages to the environment. 
And it's part of our job to make sure that we assess what those damages are and to move forward to make communities whole again. So we have a whole team of experts that work to make sure they understand exactly how things were hurt. What happened to the shoreline? What happened to the wildlife? What are the long-term effects? Population effects, things like that. Um, and they actually pulled it together in what's called an actual resource damage assessment. Um, we also call that NERDA. So during a NERDA, they figure out what went wrong or how things were damaged. And they also figure out what type of restoration might be needed. We work with partners over in NOAA Fisheries as well as with state, um, tribal organizations, and local municipalities, and other federal agencies make sure we're actually able to pull that together and really um, help restore what communities have lost. Um, for all of those things, of course, it takes a ton of science, and that's why we have great science experts on things like toxicology, oceanography, biology, um, pretty much anything that you might need in order to help protect and restore our coasts in case of an Um Now, my job in the office is the policy analyst. Um, it's my job to make sure that um, people know and understand some of those issues by working with NGOs um, and with other partners in order to help get the word out about what we do. Um, but it's also my job to review laws, new laws that come out, help people look at permits for things that are actually doing, um, really make sure that the policies that we use to help protect our coasts are ones that our scientists feel like they can stand on. Um, and so I work with our scientists every day to help communicate those issues. Um, and we're lucky to have two of our wonderful scientists here today. Um, so with that, I'll pass it over to Ken, who will also give you a brief introduction, and then we'll hear from Amy, too. Ken, do you want to take it away? Ready to go? Yeah. Hi, my name is Ken Finkelstein. I've been working for NOAA since 1987 and responding to oil spills since 1978. The first one I was at was the Amoco Cadiz, long before you were born, and then the Exxon Valdez in 89, again before you were born, and then, of course, the last one, which you probably all recall, is the Deepwater Horizon in 2010. So I have close to 40 years of responding to oil spills. I've also been a coach for the last 10 years at, on the National Ocean Science Bowl. This is the first time in the last 10 years I'm not doing it. I hope to be judging, though, when I, at our, at our uh, tournament, our competition at MIT in Massachusetts. And lastly, I'm a professor in, uh, at Suffolk University, so I'm very familiar with teaching and trying to uh, get this material across. I teach environmental science. So uh, my main interests have always been on shoreline response. And this has been from early on in my career <clears throat> when I first went to my first spill at age 22 in France. And I'm going to show you a few slides very quickly, go through them, and tell you what I think is the most important thing for you to take back from this uh, little talk. Here is the uh, uh, Amoco Cadiz in 1978. This is the way oil used to be spilled. And this is what it looks like on the shoreline, completely carpeting the shoreline, completely uh, a real mess, a high tidal range, so you get a big extent of the oil. And it's a crude oil. And if you look closely at the oil, you'll note that although it looks kind of black, you might have a little reddish tint because oil and water do mix, no matter what anybody says, and it turns into an emulsion, which the slang that we use is called mousse. Here it is on the Exxon Valdez. And... You see that uh, here, uh, again, the oil is very tarry looking, very heavyish looking, <laughs> that's because it's an emul emulsion again, also called a mousse. Very difficult to walk on this stuff. Uh, they are setting up now for a cleanup, which we're, if I get questions, I will explain that. Here's an oil spill that's very, very different. And what I'm going to try to get across from you, if nothing else, is that the type of, the way you respond to a spill the way you measure injuries and damages has always everything to do with the type of oil. So we had a barge, you see in the background, the tug caught fire, the barge comes ashore, spills all the oil, but where is it? You don't see it, right? There's no oil. Hey, well, Ken. Hey, yes? Ken. Could you yes. click, could you share your screen? It's on the left. We can't see the images. 
You can't see any of these pictures? No, you have to click screen share. Oh, I'm my God. That's okay. Uh, let me... Uh, where is screen share is where? If you hover over the video screen, and then over to the left, it'll say screen share. I see chat, screen share. There we are. And hit share. Ah, oh, what a mess. That's okay. It'll be awesome when we see it. All right. Can you see this now? Can you see it now? Nope. No. Try huh? subscribing it to us. <laughs> All right, let me try screen share one more time. I go to screen share and I hit share. It's not allowing me to do it entire. Uh, oh, here we go. Here we go. Now it'll work. You see that? No? Yes. You can see that. Well, there's your tanker offshore. Here's what it looks like onshore with a big tidal range, what I call the moose, the emulsion. Here it is at the Exxon Valdez, uh, 11 years later. Same kind of oil. It's a crude oil that mixes with the water. It uh, can almost sometimes double the amount of oil, of oil you have because you're mixing it with water. It's about 50% oil and water. And now what I was saying is they have a different type of oil spill. Again, the most important thing is the type of oil you have. And this is a, a refined oil, home heating oil and you don't see the oil. This is the next morning after the spill, 900,000 gallons. You think you'd see something. But all that oil became dispersed and uh, mixed with the water and that's what we saw the following day. Lots and lots of dead starfish, surf clams, lobsters. Here we had didn't have a cleanup. There was no cleanup. It was just dead bodies coming up because the oil is different. It's called persistence, which was the other oil and this one we'd say is very toxic. And it all depends on the chemistry of the oil. If the oil is very light, having a lot of small, uh, sorry, have a light, light compounds, or we call it the aromatics, you'll have a lot of toxicity. If it's much heavier with, with having polyaromatic hydrocarbons, bigger ones, you'll be very persistent. Here's a view of it out at the deep water horizon, sort of someplace in between, uh, sort of in between the two that I just showed you. And here it is on the beaches of Louisiana. Again, you see the oil, but it's not as extensive as you might think it would be, given the amount of oil that was lost, 200 million gallons. And what you learn from this, quite, quite evidently, is that a lot of the oil gets evaporates and becomes uh, dissolved into the seawater. And for someone like myself, who's always been worried about the shoreline, this was all great news but it causes an injury to a whole other realm and that's the animals living in the water. It's much more difficult to measure because here you're measuring concentrations of very very small amounts and measuring animals that may have been uh, affected days, if not weeks, if not months ago and you're trying to figure out the impacts of those animals. Just so you can see something a little exciting, here's a, a oil burn uh, that's often done when the oil is very light and volatile and very well evaporative. That was this was taken at the uh, Deepwater Horizon spill. And if you want to see what the spill would look like if the oil was coming on, it would look something like this. So here you're seeing the oil as it lost a lot of its light elements, light chemicals from it. Very lot of the volatile elements have all been uh, evaporated away or dissolved and leaves the heavier stuff behind and you're left with these tar balls. Remember the deep, deep water horizon occurred 50 miles offshore and it took a while before it to come to onshore but it's a different type of oil here than it was when it was released because of all the changes in the oil chemistry. And that's a really important thing to understand. Persistence, which this would be very persistent, but not all that toxic. The stuff that got left in the water column is very toxic. And that's something I would like to leave you with. And if you have more questions on that, I'd love to talk to you about it some more. And this should be over in just uh, five seconds. This is on Alabama and Dauphin Island, if people know that area at all. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. All right, I'll shut this off here.
Okay, so I'm uh, all set. Uh, Amy's up, right? Yeah, Amy, why don't you give us an introduction? Sure, I'll give you a, a brief intro. First, I want to apologize that I can't seem to make my web camera work. I don't know um, what the problem is, but I guess you're going to be stuck looking at my profile picture with me all bundled up in snowboard gear. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. Um, so my background, I have not been involved in oil spills nearly as long as Ken. I'm fairly new to the um, oil spill response business. My background is as a physical oceanographer. I went um, to graduate school at the University of Washington, and I was um, studying uh, ocean currents um, and the way that currents move things in the ocean and interact with the biology. In particular, I was looking at actually red tides or harmful algal blooms initially. So we were really interested in how those got to the coast and harmed, harmed shellfish. When I finished that research, I was, I was basically looking for, for a job and found this office here in Seattle that did oil spill response and thought, well, that can't be that much different, oil moving in the ocean to algae moving in the ocean, so maybe I have some skills to apply. Uh, it turned out it was, it was a fair bit different, but um, very interesting nonetheless, and so I started working um, in 2009, um, and look, my so my job there is to look at the transport um, of of oil in in the ocean, and to support the response that's being directed usually by the uh, Coast Guard in the case of marine waters. And so my job is to try to give them a heads up on on where the oil is going um, and what it will look like. Um, as Ken said, there's a lot of different types of oils, and all of them behave different in the ocean and have different impacts. So we try to give as much information as we can so that um, the Coast Guard can help direct the response appropriately and try to mitigate um, the harm to the environment if possible. And um, so that's, so, so basically I came to that group about 2009 and was just, you know, finishing learning, you know, reading some of the same resources that I think you were all reading as part of, part of this, the oil in the sea volume, for, for instance. And then um, suddenly a big spill in the Gulf, Deepwater Horizon happened not long after I I uh, came to the emergency response division, so I got to I got to learn on the ground really fast and get thrown into a, a spill that was many orders of magnitude bigger than the typical spills that we deal with. A lot of a lot of the spills that that are responded to, you know, are much smaller spills, frequently from fishing vessels and and, and things of that nature. So so that was quite the learning experience and and quite the quite the hopefully the spill of a lifetime for me because I definitely don't want to anything that big again. It was um, a, a very interesting experience to be involved in. So that's um, a brief intro for me. Okay, well, thanks to our three uh, experts. I guess yeah, I'm going to... Read, like, I was going to read the questions aloud. And we'll let whichever one of our speakers is best suited to answer it, go ahead and answer. So the first question we have are, what are the most important policies that relate to the oil industry? So that's a really good question. Um, there are lots of policies that relate to the oil industry, but there are really about four um, that we work with a lot in the Office of Response and Restoration. Um, the top one would definitely be the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. Um, that was really created out of Exxon Valdez, and that's what gives us the legal authority to um, do a natural resource damage assessment. Um, that's what we call a NERDA. That way we can hold people accountable um, for when they spill oil into the marine environment. It also does a lot of other things, like it sets up um, the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund and a few other laws that we use to be able to respond. I mean, a few other um, tools that we use to be able to respond to spills. Um, another one would be um, the Outer Continental Shelf Land Act. Um, that's one that really regulates offshore drilling. Um, that create some different rules that companies need to do when they're drilling, set some standards that they need to use, um, and really sort of sets the bar for making sure that it's done in a, in a safe manner and according to the law. Um, another one, um, 
and this is a this is a rule that's um, sort of run by the EPA. It's the national the national contingency plan. Um, rural EPA and Coast Guard have authority over that, um, and that has some rules about how you might use dispersive. Um, who has authority during a oil spill? Um, lots of other things along those lines. It really helps tell us how how things should be governed when we're all trying to work together to make um, to help clean up a spill and make that you know, you take that bad situation and make something a little bit better out of it. Um, so those are some of the rules. Another one is the Clean Water Act. So during Exxon Valdez, we didn't have the 90s. Um, the oil pollution in 1990. Um, and so actually we were able to use that in order to enforce some rules about pollution and really start to move forward on doing the spill layer and doing the restoration. Um, and Amy, is there anything else I missed there? Well, I would uh, go on to say it's, uh, <clears throat> remember I showed that picture of the burning oil? Well, you'd have the Clean Air Act. The company would have to be uh, uh, show that they're not polluting the air or causing injuries. Uh, to go on to the Outer Continental Shelf Land Act that Meg spoke about, I just want to point out to all of you out there that the U.S. government, or you, the public, received $32 million from BP for the lease of the Deepwater Horizon well that, of course, caused the oil spill. All that property out there, outside of three miles, inside of three miles is state, but outside of three miles, all those wells that are dug, they are dug on public property. And every time one is, is drilled, the public, or you and me, or our government, receives money from the oil companies. So it is also in our best interests as taxpayers to have that being drilled. However, they have to follow the rules and regulations of the environment, which sometimes uh, goes by the wayside, which we can talk more about. Other ones, uh, Endangered Species Act. If there's endangered species, which there are, uh, then uh, the company has to take special measures to protect them. The Marine Mammal, Pro Marine Mammal Protection Act, MMPA. Uh, all mammals are protected in some ways. Uh, in, this, in this one, uh, dolphins were injured. Uh, uh, and so those are also rules. There probably are so many laws that I could go on a blackboard, go from top to bottom, and give you all of those that get involved in, in the Deepwater Horizon. Okay. okay, our next question is, how do waves help transport oil? Uh, that's, that's a great question. I think I can um, start with that, and then maybe if anyone else wants to jump in, they can. Uh, there's a couple things that are important with waves. Um, one is for, is for surface transport. Actually, waves in general just move for a, for something that's um, you know suspended in the water column. Waves don't really transport those types of, of particles that are suspended. They just sort of move them in circles. But if something is floating on the sur on the surface, there's actually just a slight net transport in the direction that the waves are are propagating, so towards the shore. So waves can. Um, can slightly move oil on the surface towards shore, but usually it's the wind that's really more important for the surface transport. Where waves are really important, though, is for mixing um, some of the oil droplets into the water column, a process that we call dispersion. Um, so basically the oil, when we think of it on the surface, in general oil is, is lighter than seawater or fresh water, and it floats on the surface, but that surface is not very calm. It um, you know, has has waves and turbulence, and, and breaking waves in particular can drive some of the oil, um, can basically break up the slick and drive some of the oil into the water column where it's in the form of droplets. And some of those uh, larger droplets, because they're so buoyant, will rise back up to the surface and reform as part of the surface slick. But if there's sufficient you know, energy, in, it makes some of the smaller droplets that will then stay in the water column um, and, and move around within the, the subsurface. Um, so in some of those cases that Ken showed, I think at the very beginning there was one where there was uh, a lot of mortality to some um, benthic creatures, uh, th things that live on the bottom. So that was a case where this wave energy might have caused a lot of dispersion and put oil into the water column and impacted um, 
the critters that are living on the bottom. So waves, waves are really important for that. Did that make sense? Yeah. Hey, Amy, maybe a, another question that might be helpful is how do tides help transport oil? Uh, well, there's currents certainly associated with tides. When, when we think of tides, sometimes we just think of the water moving up and down. Um, but in association with that, there's also back and forth um, currents. Um, and, so the, and those can be very large currents. Um, where I live in Washington, uh, we have you know, tidal currents that can move several miles per hour, so pretty, pretty fast currents. Um, and so that can, um, you know, currents, both currents and winds move the floating oil on the surface, or currents move the subsurface oil as well in the form of these dispersed droplets I talked about. Um, so tides are really important. They will move the oil back and forth, possibly quite fast. Um, but in terms of net movement over time, because the tides tend to reverse back and forth, sometimes it will just serve to spread the oil out. I would just point out one thing about the tides. Uh, is that the very first oil spill I went to was in Brittany, France, that one I showed you, the Amoco Cadiz, the big, uh, the big tanker that was chopped in half as it ran aground uh, three miles off the coast of uh, Brittany, France. And the tidal range there is eight meters, which is pushing 30 feet. And the, f the floor, or the uh, shallow sub-bottom, as you move off, off the coastline, was very, very shallow. Uh, very, very, uh, I should say, very, the slope is very gentle. And so the water actually would disappear from sight. The ocean at low tide would disappear from sight. And of course, what it would leave behind is the oil all the way out. And so you had an enormous amount of oil covering the intertidal area between high tide and low tide. So high tidal ranges are. Uh, are, are usually a real problem for us in, in cleaning up oil on the beaches. Uh, they do provide a lot of energy that might remove the oil and break it down, but when you first coat that kind of oil spill, you have a lot of work to do. Okay, our next question is how widespread is the use of bacteria to remediate oil spills? Okay, uh, what was done at the uh, Exxon Valdez, and this is the first time it was really used in 1989. Uh, there were a little bit of plots of, uh, of uh, nitrogen baskets, and uh, I forgot the names of what they called them, but it's essentially adding nitrogen. What you're not adding is actually biological life. That's what people think you're adding, but really what you're adding is nutrients. Usually it's nitrogen or calcium, uh, and that allows the the natural bacteria to explode and grow and help eat the uh, oil. Now it doesn't really work when you have big pools of oil, which is sort of the slides I was showing you, but it works as a, as a polishing tool. And that's the way it's been used today as a polishing tool. That is, after you do the initial cleanup and you're left with bits and little bits of oil all over, you might uh, try to release this nitrogen as the, as the waves and, and, and slosh come in, it'll disperse all this nitrogen and allow the bacteria to explode in size. Now what's interesting about the bacteria is in Alaska we really needed this uh, influx of additional nutrients because it's a cold area, you don't have a lot of bacteria, whereas in the Gulf of Mexico it's warm, and humid, you already have the bacteria and on top of that you have natural seeps that have been seeping oil out of the ground, out of the water, I should say out of the uh, bottom of the ocean for the millennium, for thousands and thousands of years oil have been seeping out and so the bacteria is already there and so uh, there was a lot of natural degradation due to bacteria but we do add the back or sorry we do add the nutrients to promote the bacteria in places where we don't have that much uh, natural bacteria and also as a polishing tool okay our next okay. question is asking, are oil dispersants, such as core exit, proven to be poisonous? If so, what potential adverse effects could result from its use? Uh, I could do this too. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, overwhelm. Uh, but uh, 
if you were to have an oil, typical crude oil, and you had the uh, Corexit, and you threw your amphipods or the, of the animal you're trying to uh, uh, determine toxicity to, the animals would do much, much worse with the oil than they would with the Corexit. Corexit has some toxic properties to it, but by and large, most of the people involved in oil spills, not everyone, this is still a uh, very much a, uh, an open question, most people, including myself, feel that it's much more positive than a negative. The problem that occurred at the Deepwater Horizon was every effort was made initially to keep the oil off the beach, which is what I do, and I was just ecstatic why. Yes, keep the oil off the beach because I know the havoc it causes once it gets on the beach. You can't remove it. It's hard to pick it up. You've got to take up a lot of natural resources as you dig it all up. It gets into the wetlands. How do you get it out of there? You have to burn the wetlands. It just creates all sorts of uh, domino effect of problems. However, what happened here was that we dispersed the oil that was already very dispersive because it was very light oil, dispersed it into the water column and possibly caused injuries to a whole nother uh, group of animals, those that swim in the water and live on the bottom of the ocean. So in one respect I'm very happy that we used the dispersant on the other on the regard that maybe it wasn't uh, all that positive. I think by and large I prefer what they did and what they and they used the, the Corexit. Corexit does have some toxic properties to it. That was really the question, but not nearly as much as the oil. And if it disperses the oil, then you have a, 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 a lesser residence time for that, for that oil. But right. that's something that you really should re review and try to get the other side on this one, because there are people who feel differently. Yeah, I think this is a big question that everybody is asking these days. Um, and really, Deepwater Horizon was unprecedented to use of dispersants because it was an unprecedented oil spill. Um, it was the largest oil spill in U.S. waters. Um, and because of that, some choices were made and the trade-offs were made that using dispersants and dispersing oil into the water column would, like Ken said, help mitigate impacts to the shoreline. And that's the thing. Every time there's an oil spill, it's all about these trade-offs. And we're trying to pull together even more science, especially about the use of not just dispersants, but dispersed oil. Um, we actually just funded a few studies about what are the impacts to different animals, and about including blue crab. Um, we also funded um, a full database of some of those toxic effects of dispersants. Um, so, I mean, this is something you guys should definitely keep studying and keep asking that question because new information is going to be coming out all the time in that. Okay, a popular question here. A few people have. Um, what were the successes and failures in the handling of the Deepwater Horizon event? That is a really good question. Um, I think everybody would tell you a different answer. It really depends on some of your some of your perspectives, and obviously, this is something that brings a lot of charged opinions. Um, I will tell you one of the biggest challenges with Deepwater Horizon is that it was just such a huge oil spill. You had way more players. You had way more people trying to participate and trying to coordinate across a huge geographic area. Um, I think that was one of the top challenges. Um, and because of that, we were actually able to try some new things about responding to oil spills. Um, one of the top successes was actually, um, I would say, and I, obviously other people might disagree or might have other top successes, um, I think our environmental response management application was one of the top successes in Deepwater Horizon. Um, what that is, is you imagine all the probably thousands of people that were responding to Deepwater Horizon. How do you make sure that all of those people have the same information about the environment they're working in? How do you know, how do you make sure people know where their vessels that are skimming oil off the surface of the water, or where there are people burning it, or where there are people are predicting these, um, people like Amy are providing trajectories telling you where the oil is going to go. 
Irma is a common operational picture, so everybody can share that information, and they can work with GIS specialists to actually get that information about locations where they're going. And in some cases, they can actually share that information in real time. So, for instance, they have trackers on different boats, so that they can all see where each other were. Um, I think that was one of the huge successes from out of Deepwater Horizon, and obviously it's a tragedy. Deepwater Horizon was a really bad situation, but to actually get something to help get people on the same page in such an enormous disaster, I think that is a really a big success. Um, Amy and Ken, do you guys have other thoughts? Well, one of the things that I thought was very positive was uh, the teamwork involved. And I don't necessarily mean the teamwork among NOAA people. I worked on a team uh, that was doing shoreline assessment. So we were trying to assess the injuries to the shoreline. And to go on these teams, you had one person from NOAA, one person from the Fish and Wildlife Service, one person from the state, one person from, we're actually two people from BP. And we went out as a team from spot to spot and took our measurements and all agreed on, on the wording of those measurements so that you would not have a fight later and by and large we all work very very closely together and the reason is is because unfortunately this isn't a physics equation this is really a, a very gray science of trying to assess injury or trying to assess damages that you might have on the shoreline and you have to make some compromises and you talk it over and uh, you're going to be with these people all week so you better get along pretty quickly pretty well very quickly and we all did and I was very very pleased the way it worked out. The thing that I really don't like about the whole setup is that how once the technical teams are done and we're ready to go home how long it takes to actually come up with some kind of resolution or settlement and it still hasn't been completely settled as far as what what I worked on that is the injuries to the shoreline it's another another organism and then some of the organisms so, uh, you know, it's 2010 and it's 2015 now, and we're still uh, talking about some of the same things. Not me, myself, but the people uh, uh, who uh, have to make the decision, and a lot of those are lawyers. So it changes, it changes once, uh, once you leave, uh, other people uh, take over and uh, are looking out for the best interests of their organization, but not necessarily, might not get the things done very quickly and that's very very uh, disheartening. So I'll, I'll add a little bit now from my perspective on Deepwater Horizon and yay I got my camera working. You're there, me. you're there. Yeah, I uh, switched browsers and it seemed to do the trick. Um, but yeah I was doing the modeling um, of the oil movement during Deepwater Horizon so every day I took all the available observations of where people had seen oil and I put them in our model with currents and wind forecasts for the next few days and tried to um, you know give a give a heads up on on what was going to be unfolding over the next few days what shorelines were going to be threatened so that the proper resources uh, could be deployed and obviously the the size of the spill as Meg said made that a giant challenge because you know there was four states potentially being impacted at you know at any one time so trying to do that um, with any degree of resolution was, was really hard trying to get observations of what the oil looked like we usually rely on on overflight observers to go out um, in helicopters and fly over the spill um, and give us indication of where the heavier parts of the oil are because that's what um, the, re the response can target. They might be able to, to skim it or, or take some burn it, do some burning actions or different things. Um, so you really want to target that heavier oil. But with the size of it, uh, it just wasn't feasible for, for human observers to fly over the um, entire slick. So there was a lot of different sensors that were used on aircraft and satellite, and that was that was relatively new for a spill in the U.S. to rely on some of these new technologies. So I think a lot a lot was learned that. Um, hopefully can be applied in the future for, for detection. That was um, one of the successes from, from and challenges, I guess, from my perspective. And it was so hot. <laughs> <laughs> it was very hot down there. <laughs> the next question is asking, what are the sources of oil in the ocean? How much comes from natural? sources versus man-made sources. Cool, that was what I mentioned before. That is uh, 
uh, natural sources of the natural seeps. And that is the uh, uh, the bellwether uh, story that you'll get from the responsible party all the time is that the oil you're seeing is not due to the spill that we caused. It's due to natural seeps. You want a percentage? I really don't know. I know there are natural seeps. I know that you might get some tar balls every day onto the uh, onto the shoreline there, but it was unprecedented the difference. I mean, you went you went before the spill, you went after the spill. It was just no no comparison. So <clears throat> I think that there's very little argument uh, that uh, the Deepwater Horizon spill, that the 200 million gallons that came out, was most of the oil we saw on the beach. Uh, I'm sure the uh, there are forensic scientists out there, which is a new new science going on with with uh, the chemistry of, PA, of, of oil, is that you can look at the oil you have and look at the source of that oil and see if it really did come from the deep water horizon or came from someplace else. And that is a whole new active, very active uh, uh, science uh, career if people are interested in really learning the chemistry. Uh, uh, I think that in this case, uh, there's really no argument at all that the injuries have come from the deep water horizon. The actual percentages, I really can't tell you. I'm sure you could find it on the internet, though. Yeah, I haven't. I, 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 oh. Sorry, I just wanted to follow up to Ken and, and tell everybody watching that actually, if they are interested in learning more about fingerprinting and the chemistry, that they should check out Chris Reddy's um, webinar series uh, that we have posted on the website. Nice. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, I was just going to add about the seeps that um, I think it's also, you know, the seeps are, it is, I don't have the numbers in front of me either. It is a pretty large number in comparison to a typical year. Deepwater Horizon was, you know, not a typical year. It was orders of magnitude bigger. Um, but the thing with seeps is they tend to be slow, slowly dribbling out. So even though, you know, you integrate it over a year and you have a big number of inputs from natural seeps, but the the ecosystems around those seeps tend to be adapted to it because it's coming out slowly. So it's it's kind of it's not just volume; it's how it you know in an oil spill, it's instantaneously a large volume of oil in you know a small location, one location, so it overwhelms the system. So it's kind of a different um, different system. Okay, I'm actually going to sort of connect the next two questions. Um, one was asking, what is the most effective order of oil spill cleanup procedures? And another was asking, what's currently the best method? So one of the answer what the best method is, is really hard to do, because it depends on what's actually happening in the oil spill. Right? So for instance, we talked about oil in the water column or oil on the surface of the water. Um, or even oil washing up on shore. It really depends on what the oil is, sort of the chemistry of it, um, also where it's going and what's at risk there. So sometimes, for instance, we skim oil off the surface. Um, other times we might burn it. Um, and that's a couple of ways that you might get it off the surface. But what if it's washing up into a marsh? Um, usually we'll put boom to block it off, and then we might use some types of skimmers. But sometimes we'll also do something that's more passive. So we might put in sorbent pads for things that absorb it off, absorb um, the oil out of the water or off the ground. Um, there are so many different ways to respond to an oil spill that really the best method really needs to be decided at the time of an oil spill by the experts there. Um, and I think in terms of order, um, I would say that the first thing to do is to stop it from coming out of wherever, wherever the spill is coming from, right? You want to secure the source. Um, and if you can get it before it goes out, a skimmer might be a really good way of doing it. Um, once it starts getting to shore, you're going to start making different choices. Um, so even the order of how you're going to respond to things really depends on when you're able to get there. Does that sound about right? Yes. 
Yeah, the, the, everything depends on the type of oil. Everything, and that's what I was showing those slides for the extreme, the uh, crude oil spills of the Exxon Valdez and the Amico Cadiz, and then that small uh, diesel oil spill, uh, which uh, which you saw no oil, and you only saw dead bodies coming up, and one of the answers earlier is because the waves, it was happening, the spill curved to the storm, the tug lost its, uh, caught fire, it lost its tow, came ashore, and... Uh, Big waves were just driving the oil into the sh into the uh, into the water. Although the oil is very very light, should float, but the big waves drove it in. The animals around there took one breath or took one uh, uh, took some water in through their gills with that oil in it, and boom, they're dead. It's a cube. It's they're, it, it's, it's they're done for, and they wash up the next day. Uh, there's nothing you can do about that kind of cleanup. Uh, there's nothing at all. Count the animals. That's about it. Uh, but the, all the others, the ones that you're more familiar with, you have all sorts of choices. Uh, some, all of them are good under certain certain circumstances. Uh, some better than others uh, under other circumstances. So uh, if you had a big crude oil spill, you might want to wash the oil off the beach, trap it with a boom on in the water, and then skim it up from there. But you don't want to use too hot or too water that's too hot because you'll kill anything that survived the oil spill. So there's all sorts of parts of this that would take a whole lecture to to explain. You'd have to go through each environment and each method and talk about the pros and cons. There's no one perfect method, though. That's that's the problem. Okay, I think we have another two questions that we can link together. Um, one was asking, what do you do with the oil once it's collected? Another said, you know, is there any way to use oil that's recovered for a later use? Not that I know of. Uh, I was one of my first questions at my very first spill in 1978. was all this oil that was being collected, what are you going to do with it? And I was told at the time, this was in France, they were going to try to... Uh, uh, reuse it, so I'm going to clean it. The problem is is that the oil and water mixes together and turns into an emulsion that has, has no use whatsoever. You can't get the oil, you can't get the water out. It's completely changed its chemical form and unfortunately most of the oil is landfilled as is the, as is the oil debris, oil, oil debris, the sorbents, the booms, all that material is sent to the landfill. That's actually one of the big questions when we talk about the logistics of responding to an oil spill, is what do you do with all of the waste? Um, it's a, it can be a really big number, um, and so it's something that's really important to pe for people to think about um, when we start discussing things like drilling in the Arctic, what are you going to do with all that waste um, if there is, is an oil spill in the Arctic? Um, these are important questions that we have all of our experts considering, um, just in case. Okay, next question. Are the effects of oil spills as bad on plants as they are on animals? Well, I don't do much on, on animals, actually. I, you know, we, most of the work I do is looking at shoreline impacts, and that includes wetlands. Uh, and uh, you know, I have all these pictures. I wish I could show you all of them. Uh, I have one. I went to an oil spill in Puerto Rico, and the oil came up on the shore. It was a very heavy oil, and it coated the mangroves. And if you know mangroves, they are the wetlands or the salt marshes of the Caribbean, of uh, the tropics. They have these long roots, and they're very, very pretty and really big. And the next year, we went back, and they were all dead. So uh, the coating of the oil on the on the on the, the roots of the mangroves wound up killing them. Uh, the salt marshes often get hammered pretty badly, as you can imagine. And that was really where, where you wanted to keep the oil of the Deepwater Horizon out of all the wetlands that are in Louisiana. You wanted to keep the oil out of there, and that wasn't completely successful, but but a lot was kept kept away because once the oil gets into the salt marshes, how are you going to get them out if you try to? march in there and try to sorb it up with sorbents or rake it out or you wind up trampling the salt marsh. So I always find more impacts to the uh, uh, to the to the vegetation than I do to the animal life because animals will leave. 
However, birds, for instance, uh, 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 pisciferous birds, I believe they're called, birds that go in and grab the fish, they go right into the oil and they don't come back out. And at the Axon Valdez, there was about 300,000 uh, oiled birds that were killed uh, on the estimate. Maybe that isn't even an estimate, that's how they collected. That's the number I've always heard, 300,000. So a lot of bird life gets really destroyed. But, but the vegetation also, I mean, it's a real nightmare for everyone. Uh, uh, again, you know, the one that I was showing you that I really like, the one with, with the oil that got washed into the water column uh, that killed all the starfish and shellfish, uh, that was one where the vegetation didn't get in, impacted, but the animal life did. So it always will come back to, and I sound like a broken record right now, it's the type of oil. The type of oil will determine what's going to live and what's going to die. Does some of the crude oil settle on the sea floor? What, effects the, what effect does it have? So one of the challenges when oil gets on the sea floor um, is how do you clean it up? So you've heard us talk a lot about trade-offs. Um, so if something, if there's oil on the sea floor, it's not like oil that's floating on top of the water. You can't skim it out as in the same way. Um, and so it presents sort of a unique challenge. Um, some people might suggest that you need to actually scoop it out and um, actually remove the soil to get it out of the sediment or to actually remove the settlement to get the oil out of that environment. But then what does that do to some of the benthic organisms? Right? You have animals that are actually living on the bottom. And not just sea stars, but sometimes you have smaller organisms, uh, microbes and things like that. And what does removing the, the sediment actually, um, what would removing the sediment do to those organisms? So these are all types of questions. Um, but obviously some things can't move as quickly as um, you know, like a fish or a dolphin, and so things that are living on the seafloor will have a lot, will have some significant effects from oil if it settles to where they live. I would point out that it rarely does, and that's my answer to that question. It rare, rarely winds up on the seafloor because oil is lighter than water. The typical crude oil has a specific gravity about 0 0.9, 0 0.91. Remember, one is, uh, is, is water. And salt water tends to be about a little bit more than 1, 1.0 1. something, 0.35 or about. And so the oil only winds up on the floor of the, of the ocean when there's suspended sediment that gets mixed up with the oil and the suspended sediment then sinks to the bottom of the ocean. But it doesn't happen very often. However, there are some oils that are very heavy. Venezuelan crude oil is a very heavy one. It's about specific gravity, about 0.98. And given a little bit of uh, action in the ocean, if it was spilled there, it might lose some of the lighter elements that I was telling you about and leave the heavier one behind and it might sink to the bottom. But it's more rare than, than common for oil to wind up on the bottom of the ocean. I think it did a little more in Deepwater Horizon just because of the, um, the nature of the spill being so deep and then it going on so long, there was actually somewhat of a new mechanism um, talked about a lot following that spill, which is that, you know, all the uh, plankton living in the in the surface waters, uh, some of the zooplankton are eating, the, ingesting the oil and then basically, you know, excreting it. And so there was uh, talk about, if you've heard the term marine snow, it's basically all the stuff that's settling out um, from the upper productive layers of the ocean to the deep. And so that was sort of a new mechanism that was talked about. Um, for transporting, you know, some of the oil, and, and it would be, um, you know, it's not going to look like the slicks you're envisioning on the surface, but it's certainly a mechanism for getting some to the bottom, but because it's falling through that full depth of the water column, it is spreading out as well. But that was, it was pretty interesting, and I think that was somewhat unique to that spill because it was, you know, went on for so long and was so, so large, but it was, it was interesting. How far out can oil pipelines be used? And could you also talk about floating production and storage systems? How far out can what be used? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. How far out can oil pipelines be used? Oh. 
I, you know, I'm, look, this is the nice thing about videos is that I can see Amy and Ken's faces. Um, <laughs> I have to say, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, that is something that Department of Interior would be responsible for in terms of regulating and evaluating those kinds of things. Um, they can go really far, though. Um, yeah. And that's about as close to answering that question as I can get. <laughs> I, would say I would say 200 miles. I would say 200 miles because that's the limit of the exclusive economic zone where the U.S. has uh, any kind of uh, uh, regulatory authority. I don't mean to be uh, flippant on it, but I don't see any problem with running the pipes as far as they can, as far as people want to run them, as long as it's not an earthquake zone of sorts. Yeah, you might be able to find maps um, on the internet that show some of the pipeline infrastructure in the Gulf of Mexico. It's pretty impressive. The second part of that question was asking about uh, floating production and storage systems. Do you have any information about that? So there are some floating production and storage systems. Um, I think one of the things that you're trying to, that you're probably thinking of is like a mobile offshore drilling unit. Um, that's the kind of thing that, for instance, Shell was using in the Arctic for a little bit. Um, there are also different types of oil platforms, which um, can be sort of floating. Um, but I'm not super familiar about those. So. Um, one source that you might want to consider looking into on that is the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement at Department of Interior. They might have some more information. Okay. To what extent is the oil from Deepwater Horizon still affecting the Gulf ecosystem? That's a good question. Uh, we're still trying to answer that, and I think we're going to be trying to answer that for a long time. Um, there are some neat stories, there are some interesting stories um, about ways that um, our scientists are trying to, or new things our scientists are learning about impacts on the Gulf ecosystem. And that's all part of the broader natural resource damage assessment. Um, New studies are coming out all the time as we try to figure that out and we try to figure out how to restore the Gulf. Um, and we actually have some great links that we can probably put on the NOSB website that might um, help answer some of that question. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, it's a legal case. And a lot of these studies that we are doing, a lot of the studies that BP are doing at the same time, which will eventually be fought out in court or, or, or be resolved through a settlement, a lot of that is not available to the public, not available to me. Uh, I do know that there have been studies on sharks, there's been studies on, on tuna, there's been on studies on dolphin, there's been a lot of studies going on, and there will be an explosion of papers coming out when this gets settled. And uh, so when you ask what is being, when it, what is being injured, I'm having some feedback here. Uh, I can't really tell you this. Okay, but uh, anyway, the uh, long and short of it is that you will see a lot of this come out within the near future. I would just add to that that um, one of our other sponsors uh, for NOSB this year is the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative and um, this is another BP funded program but it is not related at all to the you know NERDA case or the um, the legal the legal uh, case that's going on so this is one source where you can go to their website gulfresearchinitiative.org and they um, they post summaries of all of the new publications as they come out. And I know one interesting study um, that's really looking at long-term effects is um, on stem cell research to uh, see what the impact of the oil spill would be on uh, obesity genes in various um, marine and terrestrial organisms. So there's a lot of very broad research going on under that program. So I encourage you to check it out. So if I swim in the oil, do I lose weight or gain weight? <laughs> It'll change your gene, and uh, that will then impact your future generations. 
Maybe. I'm not worried about that. They're trying to decide. <laughs> okay, our next question is asking if um, the seafood industry was significant, significantly influenced by the oil spills. Um, so, as an, obviously, an oil spill in the marine environment can have impacts on the seafood industry, right? So you want to make sure that the seafood's safe. Um, also, fishermen don't really want to be going out and catching seafood in the middle of an oil spill. Um, so there are lots of different things that are going to impact it, and also it can shut down, um, sometimes we shut down fisheries during an oil spill. Um, that's something that our scientific support coordinators work with um, the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is also another part of NOAA, and they work to make sure that we're providing all of the science in order to better inform that um, and to make sure that seafood that is going out is safe. Um, so that actually would be covered under um, private claims. So in Deepwater Horizon, you're probably following the news a little bit about it. That's something that's in the news a lot today as people are making those private claims against BP for those injuries. So a natural resource damage assessment, which is what we do, that actually looks at things that are called trust resources, and that looks at, you know, what about, you know, different species that are in the ocean that are there for the public enjoyment um, or just as a natural resource. And One other thing I'd like to point, point out is that is perception. Even if the fisheries in the Gulf of Mexico were not harmed at all, there would still be an injury to the fisheries, an injury to the fishermen, because the perception of the public is that these fish are tainted and uh, and they won't be able to be sold. So it doesn't always doesn't matter if there's a real injury or not. It's the perception of injury. Okay, that was our last question that came in through uh, Google+. Plus. Uh, we had two questions on YouTube. One was asking, how effective are the materials such as sawdust and hair that are used to soak up oil in the ocean surface? That was just a joke. Don't, you know, when, I, when, the, when the Deepwater Horizon occurred and people said they were collecting hair, the, it was just uh, it was just nonsense. The, the 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 products that they have as sorbents are so much more effective than hair. If, if there's ever an oil spill and someone says you need to give give up your hair, uh, just ignore it. It's it's just nonsense. There's products that are made that are much more valuable and much more appropriate and much more effective than 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 loose hair would be. Sawdust. I didn't hear about that one, but it sounds like a, an urban legend as well. Okay, and the last question is. Uh, which marine species are most affected by the dispersants used after a spill? Wow, this is this dispersant ones are killing me because I'm a uh, pro dispersant guy, and uh, it, you know I'm trying to defend my niche, you know, and uh, they certainly would impact the, the the plankton in the water. I mean, they they are dispersants that are there to disperse the oil, and they are in the water column. Uh, I, you know, I'm sure there's some people who say that they do, they do eventually sink to the bottom, but it's those animals that are living in the water column, starting with the uh, the smallest ones, which would be the plankton. Okay. Um, if anyone else has any last questions, go ahead and, and type them in. Um, otherwise, I guess maybe we'll ask our three speakers if they have any. Uh, last words um, this evening before we end this broadcast. Uh, I th I was you know I teach this a lot in school and my, in, in Suffolk University and in college and I never get the questions about the dispersants and I really appreciate those because that is the the issue that's come out of this Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Never before has it been so thrown in and uh, thrown up by many many people. As, as something that might be bad uh, when indeed at the time I thought it was something that was being done that was good keeping the oil in the water and not on the beach now we're starting to learn that maybe we went over we went overboard with it and that's really is uh, a really good topic to keep working on it's probably the one uh, one thing that we still don't know have an answer for 
and it's probably the biggest question that will come out of the Deepwater Horizon was the use of dispersants the right way to go. In my opinion, it was because there was a lot less impacts to the shoreline. That's been my, always been my interest. Um, if I were to leave you with one last thought, um, I would actually point out our office actually responds to about 120 to 150 oil spills a year. Um, and that's not just incidents like Deepwater Horizon. That's things like boat collisions, um, ship groundings, um, all types of other events, sometimes pipeline leaks. Um, when you think about oil spills, don't just think about Deepwater Horizon, but think about those 150 spills that NOAA is also out there responding to. Those are a lot smaller, but it still means that we need all the same science to be able to respond to it really well. Um, and that's going to be happening, you know, oil spills are really sad, but it's something that we're going to be continuing to investigate and deal with that issue in the future, as long as we're using oil. And I hope that you guys, because this is kind of future interest, and you continue to learn about this, um, because it's not a problem that we're going to be over with anytime soon. I guess if we're making our, our closing remarks, I'll just say that what struck me a lot um, in our conversation today was that we gave a lot of kind of it depends answers, you know, especially with regards to response. You had a lot of questions about what's the best response option, and, and obviously it's a really complex subject, and we keep coming back to this idea of trade-offs, um, that you really have to think about what your resources are that you're trying to protect, what's most important, what's going to recover the fastest, what's the most sensitive, and then look at all the different options available to you, and, and you're basically choosing between, you know, less, you're trying to choose the lesser evil. There's never, unfortunately, unless you can stop from spilling the oil in the first place, you know, you've already got a bad situation, and you're just trying to make it less bad. There's no way to make it good. Um, so that's, I guess, my, my takeaway. I wish I said that. That's just perfect. So there's careers out there for you all to make it right. Okay, well, I guess uh, thanks, Amy, Ken, and Meg. This was really great. We got a lot of really interesting questions, and um, and your answers were really thoughtful and helpful. Um, again, for those of you watching, if you could send us feedback about the event to nosb at oceanleadership.org, we'd really appreciate it. We want to make sure that we're doing things that are helpful to you all. Um, so thanks, and have a great night, everyone. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.